So today I want to talk about my 10 year journey grinding after pharmacy school. So for those of you who don't know, I graduated pharmacy school back in 2013 when I was 23. So I graduated relatively younger than most people and I came out with a $120,000 job with $250,000 of student debt. And at the time, the first reflex is, oh, this is great. This is the first time ever that I'm actually making money. You know, when I was in high school, I thought making six figures, you're set for the rest of your life. You know, for some reason, it was, it was like a huge milestone. And I was like, oh, I'm pretty much guaranteed as a pharmacist to make six figures. So I thought I was set and, you know, graduated, worked um, for like two years and was really happy, right? Like I was making money. I never made money before. And it was just nice to be able to afford things myself. I could like go on vacations. If I want to buy something, I can afford it. I can buy it. It's my own money. So I was just very, very happy to work. And, you know, honestly, from 2013 all the way until I'd say 2017, all I really did was invest in my 401k if I had the opportunity. I think my first job didn't have a 401k. My second job did. So, you know, I'd max that out, which is what, r roughly around $20,000. So I would try to max it out for, you know, every year. And then on top of that, I, I was focused on like increasing my income, my W-2 income. So, you know, I went from like 120k and I think my next job was like 150k and uh, everyone got like, a huge raise. So like, you know, I was making probably like 160k and I was living at home, you know, which is a huge privilege that I had. And it's just very common in Asian American culture to, to live at home. And what was really nice about that was because I wasn't paying rent and, you know, keep in mind in the Bay area rents, like at least $2,000. Um, I could save that money and I was using that to try to pay off my student loans. So I basically was just working, um, you know, 40 hours a week. I, I didn't really do overtime. Um, just kind of did my, my five, eight hour shifts and on my free time, I would just like relax or go work out or something. And, you know, I was living at home, so I was able to save on rent. And when I did rent for my first job, I just rented a room, right? Like it was just like a, a room. I remember I was like 500 bucks a month for just a room, which you know I thought was cheap um, at that time. So basically, you know, try to limit my rent as little as possible. You know, I had no rent at one point, um, save money, um, didn't really lifestyle inflate. I mean, I definitely bought what I wanted, but for me, I just found a lot of enjoyment in like eating out. Like that was probably like most of my money being spent was just eating food. And, you know, I was buying clothes for myself. I bought probably too much clothes that, you know, I still wear today, <laughs> like eight years later. Um, and, you know, if I, I went, I'd go on vacation like twice a year. So I never really you know, skipped on vacations, but I would like credit card hack and, you know, buy like when Chase Reserve first came out, I would use those points to basically cover my flight. And I just have to pay for like, you know, what I, the hotel or the food I did or activities I did there. But you know, generally speaking, didn't go stay at fancy hotels. We didn't really eat fancy food. Like, I remember going to Japan, like, whether I was eating, like, omekase or just, like, some random ramen shop in the train station, like, I enjoyed it just as much. So, you know, kind of, kind of going back, it, I was able to save a decent amount, right? Like, I, geez, was probably taking home maybe around six to $7,000, and my expense was a thousand dollars a month and you know keep in mind this wasn't rent right because I, I was living for free so i was able to save like five thousand dollars a month and you know on top of maxing out my my 401k i basically was trying to pay up my student debt that's all i knew right so i i would try to like kind of save on average you know 60 70k a year and then throw that at my student loans because all i really knew was pay off your debt like that's bad that's 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 all i knew and you know just did that Every time, you know, tax return hit, you know, I always got extra money. I just throw that at my um, student loans. And I remember in probably middle of 2017, I finally paid off my student loans. You know, keep in mind, my interest rate, it's like only 3%. So, and then next I was just like, 
well, shoot, like what's next, right? So, you know, didn't really think about it. Um, was moving up my pharmacy career to like pharmacy leadership and, you know, increase my W2 income even more. And, you know, just kept the same thing, right? Like I was just living at home. I was like, okay, well, let me, let me say it for our house now. Like, you know, I was probably like 27, 28 at the time. And I was just like, well, next logical step is why well, my student debt's paid off. Um, you know, I've been investing in 401k. Like next is you, you want to save it for a house, right? So basically I, I started saving it for my house. Um, you know, I tried to save 80,000. Probably took me like a year and a half to two years to do that. And that's when I bought my first single family home, right? And then I remember that was in November of 2017. After Thanksgiving, I, I remember closing and, you know, going to my house for the first time. And, and it, it was a surreal experience. And then from there, you know, did the same thing where I, I would, you know, house hacked it. I lived in a master bedroom and then I would rent out the three other bedrooms for $3,000 uh, total. So a thousand each and that covered my mortgage. And I remember I was spending around $1,500 to live there, you know, for utilities and property tax, insurance, all that stuff. Right. So I was just like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm paying 1500, which is obviously more than, you know, free at home. But I was essentially paying myself because it would just go down towards paying my own equity. And then because of that, I was able to save a lot of money again, right? Because I, I would have to spend, you know, 1500 for my living expense plus another 1000 for, you know, whatever I wanted to do. So I was $2,500 a month and my income kept on going up, right? So, you know, I repeated the process again and I house hacked the second house and then house hacked the third house and then... At that point, I was at the fourth house, and then I bought a single-family home out of state in Alabama because I was just like, you know what, I, I, I don't. And this was in, so from 2017 all the way to 2021, I basically like house hacked almost one house a year, right? So I would just you know, save money, uh, increase my um, earnings, and it was almost like a game for me. Like, how much money can I save? Like, I remember when I bought the house, like, I remember literally using all the money I had for the down payment. And I remember I had like $2,000 in my bank account. And that was the first time I was just like, oh, wow, like I've never been this low. And it, it made me feel very tight because I'm like, oh, I need to like save money. And like, so I stopped eating out for a little bit and really trying to like make it work and, and, and all that stuff. So it, it, you know, I was actually more, I gamified. I was like, oh, how much money can I save? Right. It became a game on Bible real estate. And in 2017, 2021, I, I did that. And then in 2021, I just said, you know what? I don't want to house hack anymore. Um, I want my own privacy, right? You know, you know, at this point I was, you know, 30, 31. So, you know, pretty much been living with my parents or house hacking from 23 to 30 for seven years. And just said, you know what? I, I've deferred my gratification enough. You know, I, I laid a nice financial foundation. Like I want to rent a house, you know, just for me and, and my girlfriend and um, but still invest in real estate. So at that point it was just like, well, you know, I just relocated Southern California. I don't, I don't really know where I'm going to be. Um, you know, I bought a house that I said I was going to live in, but I ended up not living in because I had to relocate for a job again, but I bought it for like 10% down during COVID low interest rates below, I think 2.7% interest. And I rented out the house and you know, I just said, okay, well, I at least bought that property. Even though I'm paying rent, you know, I'm still getting rental income from this property, building equity. Um, and I just said, okay, well, um, okay, I still, you know, can't afford any other houses here in California. It's obviously more expensive. So I was like, all right, well, let me look out of state. So I started buying new builds in Alabama. I just bought one. And like, I was planning on buying 10, to be honest. But I just said, huh, like, Maybe let's do apartment complexes. And that's when I went into, you know, buying my 26 unit apartment complex, which led me to my mobile home park, which led me to my 20 unit apartment complex. And, you know, I funded that by doing cash out refinance on my single family homes because I built up, you know, over almost like $2 million of equity uh, amongst all my single family homes because of the crazy, you know, bull market in, in California and, you know, it straight dropped too. So the, the value went high. So I would do cash out refinance. I actually lower my rate. But so on top of that, I pull out a bunch of cash tax free and then use that to buy my apartment complexes and my mobile home park. Right. Initially, I was thinking of taking that money out and like buying, you know, 10 of these Alabama new builds for like 70K down each. 
right? So I'd be like seven hundred thousand dollars. But once I learned about multifamily, it was just like, well, the value is based on the income divided by the market cap rate. I was like, oh, like and I thought it'd be more cash flow too, because like my Alabama one, it cash flows eight hundred bucks a month. So honestly, if I bought ten of them, I'd have eight thousand dollars a month, right? So that's that's pretty good. Like it's pretty easy. You know, it's a new build. There's still warranties. Um, it's nice and great neighborhood. Um, you know, high quality tenant, good school. You know, I had a great, great property manager, but I just said, you know what? I'm really interested about this this multifamily, um, and I can get cash flow and appreciation, right? So as I increase my cash flow, I increase that net upper income, increases the value. So I was like, whoa, why? Before single family, I was choosing cash flow or appreciation. Right, because Alabama, it's more cash flow. I mean, there's appreciation, but it's it's not like it's a drop in the bucket relative to California. But with apartments, I was like, okay, well, you know, if I double the rents and it's worth eight hundred thousand um, dollars, then after I double the rents, it's gonna be worth one point six million. So my cash flow is gonna be crazy, right? From like, you know, like what is it, um, nine thousand to eighteen thousand, and the cash flow will double uh, increase significantly and then my value doubles so i was just like all right well let, let me try this so you know that's why i went on this huge journey and then i bought my bone park thinking it was, it was more cash flow focused and you know if it stabilized yes but i bought a value add one and those lose money right because you get to put money into it and and there's a lot of operating expense uh, especially if the landlord owns the, the home so you know if i if i have the guts of doing mobile home parks again i, I would want it you know, all tenant owned homes, um, you know, public utilities. And, you know, the only value add is maybe just bringing in some new homes to sell, right? Like just keeping it really simple, but you know, just the mobile models was too complicated. And when things are more complicated, there, there's more points of failure. When there's more points of failure, there's more opportunity to lose. When there's more opportunity to lose, um, you're spending a lot more blood, sweat and tears, right? So I just say, you know what? Mobile home park's not for me despite buying it. So I'm process of selling it. And then, you know, I bought another 20 unit apartment complex as well and, and trying to renovate that. So, you know, I, I could have had, um, you know, for context, if I bought those 10 Alabama homes and each were about, you know, $2,000 in rent. So that would be $20,000. But for, for the same money, I bought, you know, basically two apartment complexes, right? My 26 unit and my 20 unit and that one's grossing me once stabilized it's probably grossing me around 26,000 right now a month once stabilized maybe 28,000 so if you do the math well the single family homes is about $20,000 a month the same money I got $28,000 a month and, and 46 units versus um, 10 single family homes right and because I essentially like doubled the rents um in the apartment complex it doubled the value so basically i bought my 20 unit um for 350 and then my 26 unit for you know half a million probably all in for 800,000 for that one the other one i was all in for roughly 450 so you know roughly if you double it so not only is my cash flow higher my equity position is higher too right like i have just on my 26 unit, <clears throat> I put $800,000 or 1.6. That's $800,000 of equity in the 26 unit. <clears throat> the 20 unit, you know, it wasn't a home run, but I think I was all in for 450 and it was worth about 600. So I made 150K in equity. So if you add that up, that's almost a million dollars of equity that I forced up and I have 28K a month in cash flow versus my Alabama. If I bought 10 single family homes, I'd get $20,000 a month. And I think my Alabama home went up by I bought for like two seventy and now it's worth three hundred. So each one up by thirty K. So times ten, that's three to thousand. So just do the math, right? <clears throat> single ten single family homes gets twenty K a month and made uh three hundred thousand dollars in equity. Same money. I bought forty six units, it makes twenty eight thousand dollars a month, and I forced up one million dollars in equity. So once I kind of did that mental math, it just made sense to go to multifamily, right? Like, don't get me wrong. I, I still might like, um, 
the, the multifamily is a lot more work, right? A lot more sweat equity that I'm putting in there. A lot more time, a lot more effort versus if I just bought those 10 single family homes, it's very easy, right? Like uh, my agent, my realtor could have given me like 10 deals easily. I could probably buy a deal every like two months. Like literally rent, buy one, rent one out. Once it's rented out, buy another one, rent it out, buy another one, rent it out. It's easy, right? I don't even want to sweat, right? And versus the apartments, you know, I had to spend like two years to like fix these up. So, you know, you have to really analyze where you're at. Like for me, I don't mind doing the value right now, but maybe when I have kids and a family, maybe my motivation won't be as high and I don't mind buying you know, single family homes. So, um, so yeah, that, that brings me to today, right? 2023. So I started, you know, working at 2013 and, you know, fast forward 10 years. Um, you know, I haven't bought real estate since May of 2022. So, you know, it's been almost a year and a half of me not buying real estate, which is very shocking because I've been buying real estate almost every year um, since 2017. And the reason was because I had to stabilize my portfolio, right? Like I literally exhausted all my capital that I had and I hit my mental capacity where I cannot do anymore, right? So I, I financially and mentally hit my wall. I said that like I need to actually sell some things. I'm selling my mobile home part. And then once... Um, my apartments, they're, they're stabilized at this point, right? I literally just need to rent out like two more units in each. So a total of four and, you know, three out of the four are ready to rent right now. I just need one renovated and, and basically I'm done. Right. And then, you know, once I, um, get all my money back from my mobile home park, it, you know, may take like another three years from now. Cause I'm, I'm doing a seller carry second. Um, I get my money back and at that point I can buy more real estate again. Right. And I'm trying to save up to buy my single family home as well. So, uh, why I wanted to share this was like, this was my 10 year journey, right? Like I just didn't get here overnight. Like it's easy to say, Hey, I bought like 90 units and like eight units in eight months. Right. Like, no, like, yeah, I did do that, but you don't see all the work I've done starting at 23. Right. Like I started off making, you know, decent W2 and a lot of student debt. And then you fast forward 10 years later, you know, I own 90 units of real estate. After I sell my mobile park, I'll be at like, you know, 50 units. Um, and then, you know, built a, 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 a cash flowing machine, right, with 50 units. And if you even go back before that, like even finishing pharmacy school in five years, you know, that's hard too. Like not many people do that. Uh, you have to be very book smart and, and it's, it's a grind as well. And then even to get into that program, it's a grind in high school, right? So like I, I've been working my butt off since I was like 14, you know, until 33. So it's almost like 20 years, right? And, and, and this is what I mean by exponential growth for like, you're just very linear and all of a sudden you just grow exponentially. And then maybe I'm gonna hit a point where I'm linear again and I'm gonna grow exponentially again, right? Like, um, <clears throat> you know, interest rates are not as desirable right now. So unless I get deals, you know, seller financed and can negotiate, you know, low interest rates or, um, I'm just going to be seeing my real estate portfolio, right? Like I can't really do cash out refinances because why would I refinance my, you know, 4% interest rate for something that's seven to eight, right? If interest rates drop back down, you know, to around 5%, you know, maybe during the, you know, 2024 elections, you know, interest rates will drop down, um, to stimulate the economy and make people more optimistic. Um, I might do a cash out refinance, you know, pull my money out and then, um, uh, buy more real estate or it's fine. Like I, I don't mind just sitting on it, give myself a break, you know, like buy a house for me that, that I wanted to live in, um, you know, with my girlfriend. And cause you know, for me, I, I like investing. My, my core reason was not to build super with a lot of wealth. I mean, I eventually will, but like for me, it was just like lifestyle freedom. Like I just want the option to like not have to work. Um, I want the option to like just be able to travel freely if I can. Like if I want to go somewhere, I just want to go there and not think about it. And I understand that there, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes to, to getting there, right? Like you, you have to really work your butt off, um, you know, in your 20s, your 30s, and then maybe you can reap the benefits in your 40s, right? Like, you know, I, I could probably, you know, just based off my 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 two apartment complexes, it probably can replace my income, um, you know, here shortly. Um, so I could probably retire by, by, you know, 35, you know, two years and, and, but, you know, I don't mind working, um, you know, still it's hard to get a job here in Southern California. So I don't, I don't mind working, but <clears throat> if something happened where I got laid off or, or let go for whatever reason, then, you know, I'd probably take a sabbatical and, 
and you know go travel and just really you know experiencing things um you know for me so just trying to take advantage of this time and you know it's kind of funny i I, this is kind of an asian thing but you know reading your stars so my, my girlfriend actually read my stars and it said that like i would work hard for 10 years and after the 10 years i would finally reap the benefits of my all my hard work and it was kind of crazy when she said that because, you know, this video, like, I, I've been working my butt off since 2013 to 20, 2023. That's 10 years. And then now my real estate stabilizing. I can finally reap the benefits of all my hard work, right? Like, to me, just working a W-2 is easy. Like, if I only just need to work a W-2, it's easy for me, you know, versus, like, working a W-2 and I'm trying to stabilize nine units. That's that's hard work, right? I'm basically doing two jobs. So, to me, W-2 is easy. Like, I, don't, I my W-2 job, I think it's, like, so easy. Like, I don't really need to put that much time and energy and um you know can do the job and you know basically be an autopilot you know it's a routine work at this point and you know you just do what you can at work and then leave work at work and then go home and then do your business right so you know that's what i've always been able to do and, and juggle so um you know kind of listening to the stars right now and, and after the 10 years you know give myself a little break um you know i say that but once the race drop i might be tempted again but give myself a break you know find a house for me you know enjoy the, the benefits of my reward um and you know maybe slow it down for a bit and then you know when i'm ready i'm gonna go back and, and buy my real estate right like you know real estate always be there it's something that i want to do for the rest of my life and because i'm not like trying to be a billionaire from real estate or even like 100 million like i just you know want to be comfortable and and just live my life and and have financial freedom um that, that's more important to me than being a lot of wealth and i don't mind giving up the the wealth to have that Right, like I think there's a way to live your life on your terms, but also still building wealth. Maybe not as fast as you could if you're going like 120 percent, like I'm doing now. But I can probably still grow my real estate portfolio and my wealth slowly. You know, going at 60 percent. Right, so it's it's a different season, different life, and you know I have the knowledge now, so it should be easier. So you know, overall, hopefully you, you found value from this rant. I just wanted to kind of share that. You know, I'm not an overnight success. It's a lot of work. A lot of grind and um i just started sharing it you know this past year when i hit 90 units already right but i no one saw the 10 years of work that i've done you know prior to that um to get myself to this point so you know i want to share this because like people see my success and think they can do it as fast as me i mean you can if you have a lot of you know equity in homes um or if you don't mind raising money from others but for me i, I that's not what i want to do i don't want to raise money um, at least right now and i just want to live life on my terms like i don't need to own like whatever syndicate of thousands of units i'd rather just own like 100 units myself and and have a portfolio that i like and i full control over and, and you know have property managers that I, I trust and they can do their job and you know if anything happens i can take the hit right so that's kind of my goal and um what i'm trying to do so i, I was playing a lot of offense um on scaling and now i'm trying to play defense to, to stabilize my portfolio and, and, and see where i'm at because uh, i'll tell you when you're renovating 90 units it's easy to lose track of your budget right if everything's going over budget it's easy to lose track so now it's my time to pause and reflect and, and really analyze like do, do i want to do this so once again hope you enjoy my rant and hope you see you in the next one thank you so much